I don't think Jimmy, Mr. Beast, is a bad person. Yeah. I don't think their team are bad people. They're doing something good, so why do I feel weird? Yeah. You know, is there something wrong with me? They can't see, but we have all the technology to fix it. Yep, half of all the blindness in the world is people who need a 10 minute surgery. Crazy. Yeah. The thing that feels bad about this is that it's necessary. You know, it's not that Jimmy and his team are bad people. It's not that the people getting this surgery are bad people. It's not that the doctor doing it is a bad guy. It's that it's weird to live in a world where if you have an easily curable condition and you live in the wealthiest country in the history of human civilization that you have to rely you know, on, on a guy in his early 20s and his friends to pick you to fix it for a YouTube video. Hi, my name is Michael Burns. I am a host and writer and producer at a YouTube channel called Wisecrack, where we make content about big ideas in a way that's fun and dare I say sometimes funny. Here at Wisecrack, we love good merch. In fact, each of us owns an estimated average of 1.75 Grateful Dead t-shirts. Although I, I kind of skew the curve on that. Um, but this one's, I mean, this one is, is like colored and this one is like a whiter thing. And this one has a totally different font and it's from a different tour and this one this one was limited edition okay they're they're all the same so i'll like just rewind the clock a little bit for you so from academia so i'm pretty sure you are looking at the world of like being a professor or something mm -hmm. in academia at what point you decided that hey youtube or like media is the route which you want to pursue yeah so i never really made a conscious decision uh, it's sort of a path i fell into i'm very glad i fell into it um, but the last year I was in academia, I was spending a lot of my time doing like comedy, performing, hosting live events and stuff. And around that time, two things happened. One is that my partner moved to LA, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, a long distance relationship from England to LA is hard. Cross the line. Um, yeah. And at the same time, I got linked up with the guys who founded Wisecrack. And when I met them and expressed that I was sort of an academic, but also a, a comedian and a writer, uh, they were excited to get me involved in what they were doing. So uh, moving to L.A. and getting involved in that was sort of partially for personal stuff, partially for career stuff, but was also pretty burned out on uh, academia, academia at the time. Yeah. What was your uh, pursuit in academia? Yeah, so um, I, I had a, did a Ph.D. in philosophy, mostly worked in European philosophy, like stuff around existentialism and social and political stuff, uh, the, you know, the sexier aspects of philosophy, <laughs> if I do say so myself. And um, yeah, but I just did a lot of teaching, um, taught at a few different universities, was writing academic papers, but you probably know some of this. When you write an academic paper, you might put six, nine months of your life mm -hmm. into a thing that if 50 people read it, <laughs> it's a big deal. Not the so. best feeling, yeah. Yeah. It was, I remember like the first thing I ever did at Wisecrack and the first thing I ever did on YouTube was yeah. script writing. And you know, first script I wrote comes out, and you're like, "Wait, three hundred thousand people watch watched this," it, yeah, no. which, in the YouTube world, might not be the best, but from that academic perspective, yeah. it just blew my mind. So during that switch, while you were like moving on to uh, from an academia role to a creator first mm -hmm. role, in your head, what were the transferable skills? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I think the biggest one or one of the biggest ones was an ability to understand ideas at a high level, but then be able to translate those mm -hmm. in an accessible and engaging way. Because mm -hmm. in a university setting, you know, some, sometimes it'd be nine in the morning, you're standing in front of a room of 25, 19 year olds, half of which are hungover, half of which might have not slept that night, one of which might be actively on drugs. And it's your job to get them to give a shit. Can I swear? Yeah, yeah sure. To give a shit about, you know, maybe someone's been dead for 500 years. Yeah. So you have to find ways to make that content in just in, not only inter, uh, interesting, but make it matter to them. Yeah. And in my mind, at least in the work I've done on YouTube, it's a lot of it is like, how can you take an esoteric idea, a big idea, a complex idea, but present it in a way where you're going to hold someone's attention who has, you know, a whole window on the side of their screen, giving them 10, 10 other things they might want to watch, you know? Yeah, and what you said, it's like there's another aspect to like being in academia and also being in the journalism world, which mm -hmm. is a lot of time when people who write stuff, they mostly write stuff for the acknowledgement of people in their sphere. Exactly. And yeah. not necessarily write or make content for the normies. 
So, yes. but when you are making YouTube stuff, mm -hmm. your content should like appeal to any like someone who doesn't give two shits about that content. For sure. And, and I think, you know, with the work we do at Wisecrack, we would be hurting ourselves and alienating our audience if we presented things in such a way. Like a highbrow way, yeah. Yeah, that required, you know, a, a master's degree and whatever. Yeah. At the same time, we'd be insulting them if we didn't take their intelligence seriously yeah. and present ideas in a way that um, was complex. You know, because I do think there's a lot of people creating content yeah. that's about ideas mm -hmm. that fall into the trap of dumbing things down. Yep. And I think... By one metric, that's just it's treating your audience like they're dumb. Yeah. And I think most people are not dumb. They're not dumb. <laughs> and also there's like uh I don't know, like a cynical way of looking at it is mm -hmm. like they are intentionally making content to appeal to the lowest common denominator just yeah. to get the eyeballs. For sure. Yeah. For sure. And, and you know, like we, we all operate in this this paradox, right? Of we want to make good content that we care about that we can put ourselves into and that we feel proud of. At the same time, people have to click it. Correct, yeah. And I think that there's this balance and maybe sometimes people can swing too, too far, far. Yeah. towards that. I, I think, and maybe we can talk about this more later, it's something at Wisecrack we're really in the middle of right now, yeah. of really trying to figure out where that needle lies between- I would definitely love to get yeah. back to that, but yeah. let's go back to the yeah, timeline. Yeah. So when you cross the Atlantic mm -hmm. and join Wisecrack, at what stage of the company was Wisecrack operating and mm -hmm. what would like what were their hiring decisions and yeah. what, what what was the trajectory of the company? Okay, so I I, I kind of have a up and down journey there too because I I started f doing freelance stuff for Wisecrack when they were maybe I want to say two years into things, mm -hmm. and at that point that looked like uh, writing a lot for them, doing some research, going on podcasts, and then I think it wasn't until a year or two in that I started hosting sometimes. And I was freelancing for them on and off for three years, maybe four, while mm -hmm. I was also writing for other places, doing some like acting and performing and stuff like that. And it wasn't until three years ago um, that I went full time there. So interesting. in my experiences of, you know, the early phase when I was there, it was an independent company. Yeah. D didn't have a parent company. They were running things themselves, had a pretty solid team, had an office uh, here in Silver Lake. Um had a lot of freelance writers and researchers making stuff, a small team that was finalizing everything. Um, but it was a pretty impressive operation. In the time that I was freelancing, they got acquired, or I guess we now got acquired by a larger mm -hmm. media company. By the time I was full-time, we then got acquired by another media company. Yeah. Um, it's like a nesting doll situation. Yeah. yeah, so it's kind of shifted every time, yeah. you know, because I got to see what it looked like when the founders and creators themselves were running things. Yeah. I've gotten to see what it looked like when a medium-sized company yeah. uh, acquired us and worked with us. And now I'm getting to see what it's looked like as a much larger and international com company uh, ha has acquired us. I definitely wanted to get back to this later, but like, mm -hmm. let's go in right now because it's so interesting to mm -hmm. me. It's like, talk me about that transformation in like a media company when it's just the let's work in the garage kind of attitude and yeah. it's like the romantic phase. From yeah, that to getting acquired, like what goes on into a company like that? I mean, for sure. I, again, like I was less involved in a full time way in that romantic phase. Yeah, with Wisecrack, but you know the the foundation of it is was some friends who liked making stuff and talking about movies. Yeah, who starting putting things on YouTube. I think were surprised to see what clicked, what didn't, and it was at a time where I think a you could make decent money on YouTube. Yeah. And it was be a time where YouTube was looked at a little bit more like a place where people would produce, I guess like high, high, high end's not the word I'm looking for, like higher production value polished, yeah. shows. Yeah. They were definitely more polished. Yeah. Um, and it was an era as well where I think there was this feeling that if you make some type of series yeah. on YouTube, we're talking about the era when this is right after like drunk history, when someone yeah. made- That's when like Buzzfeed was coming up. That yeah. Time, yeah. Yeah, so you had this era where it looked like things could really pop off. Yeah. Uh, so I know in the early days of Wisecrack, and again, I was only um, a temporary part of the team at that point, there was more of that. And of course, early on, you, uh, like Facebook had a much bigger role uh -huh. in video stuff before they demonetized and, and right. ruined everyone's lives. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think at that stage, it was a bit more romantic. It was a bit more 
you know, and, and there's even language that was a part of, and it's still on some of our stuff, that was a part of the early Wisecrack PR marketing website stuff that described what they were doing as like a collective thing. Okay. Like it was like, we are a collective of academics and writers and all this sort of stuff. And I think that at a time, it was kind of that. Um, and it was a lot of people working together to do something new and make something cool. What was like initially, like what was the key demo thing? Like who are we making content for? I mean, I think it's basically always been 18 to 35, mostly yeah. males. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think. Ah, God. I, I think Keep it, coming it, back to that. Yeah. I think it ends up falling into that because, yeah. and, and you know, it's it's like a chicken or the egg thing, yeah. right? Do you try to make content for a demo, yeah. or do you make content a that you like? Yeah. You look at the data and you say, oh, and and yeah. I will say yeah. we've shifted a lot in recent years yeah. in ways that I love because I think our whole team is like we we're fine with eighteen to thirty five year old guys watching our stuff, yeah. but we want to be inclusive of. Every, every yeah. type of human being yeah um but yeah but i don't know i think that early on it was like aimed at film nerds philosophy nerds and i mean nerd in the best way possible yeah yeah, yeah. but people that had one foot in media and entertainment and yeah. one foot in big ideas and who wanted to bounce the two off each other got it talk to me about like so you moved to hollywood basically to mm -hmm. pursue this was the, did the irony ever like click in your head that you're in hollywood but at the end of the day you're making youtube content as great as it is like did yeah. the group ever talk about that hey do we want to make youtube content forever like what was yeah. their vision i mean if i'm i guess i'll speak to myself and into what they were doing but they're parallel there was big periods at wisecrack where the goal was how can youtube content be a jumping off point for other things interesting and in the time that i've been there i there have been countless times where it's this meeting this deal this pitch this thing we're developing and it kind of felt like we were always on the precipice of like oh well we could turn this into a streaming show we could mm -hmm. turn this into a docu-series get this on streaming see if a tv network would buy this all that sort of stuff i feel like the shift now though is a lot more comfortable and content and like we make youtube stuff yeah and i've even had that experience too of when i first moved to la and you know i had friends that were writing on tv shows and stuff like that yeah i would be a little bit aw shucks like i, I just do youtube stuff yeah and now i feel totally different about that yeah um and i think the perception has shifted but i and i think that's kind of been the shift overall both personally and for the channel gone from youtube videos as jumping off point to youtube videos yeah. as ending themselves Correct, because like, and correct me if I'm wrong here, like for a long time, it felt like YouTube is the place for, what's up guys? Like, mm -hmm. how are you doing? Like, like yeah. that kind of stuff. And now finally, like, like, like the rest of the industry is like catching up to the fact that this is mainstream for most consumers. Yeah, and I, th I think it's like the mainstreaming of parasocial content. Correct, right? yeah. And, and I think early YouTube and early Wisecrack stuff, Yeah. You know, some of the things that popped off earliest were character-based things. Mm, yeah. Um, like Alien's Guide and Thug Notes. That's where I found you guys. Yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, those were things where these were actors and comedians, yeah. very talented, awesome dudes, playing characters. Great it, writing. Yeah. Yes. Um, but there was a level of remove between yeah. this person performing, yeah. um, still hit all the stuff we like, educational, yeah. media-based. But I think that the team and me when I was first involved – have had this journey from that's what you do, characters, all this sort of stuff, mm. to now it's like people want human beings who are real and relatable yeah. that they feel like they could hang out with. You, right. you want to you want to spend time watching YouTube content by the person that you want to get a Talk coffee to, or a beer yeah, with. Yeah. yeah, because I we have TV. You know what I mean? We, we, have, we have characters. Exactly. We have fake people already. Yeah. We need real people talking to us like we're real human beings. Yeah. And like you said, it's like the term gets overused a lot. But in this case, that was at the actual dawn of parasocial relationship. Mm -hmm. And you guys saw the benefit in like leaning into that over characters. Well, that right? I, I would say, if anything, we lagged behind. Okay. To be totally honest. So, you know, I had an experience which was super hard by many metrics where I went from being one of the host mm -hmm. and and sort of like the the not second tier yeah but you know the the second person after you know jared who founded the channel correct who was the voice of the channel mm -hmm. and by voice of the channel not just literally his voice yeah the scripts all ended up in his voice mm -hmm. you know so when i first started it was awkward because i would 
read scripts yeah. off a prompter that weren't tailored for me, you, yeah. for my voice, my personality. So for the first couple of years, I don't think anyone, people that listen to our podcast, I think knew me. Correct. But if yeah. you just watch the videos, yeah, it, there wasn't anything special going on. And I think it, it had been a slow transition. And finally, when I took over as the full-time host, which has been, we're coming up on three years now. Um, that was one of the first things I had to start pushing for was like, yeah. I, I, if I'm going to keep doing this, I, it has to be me. Like I want to talk like how I talk. I, I want to present myself how I am in the world. Yeah. And there is definitely reticence from some people on the team to do that. Getting a little personal, like, like you it. said, uh, you had like a cushy job and you pretty sure you have a PhD and like you were a doctorate, mm -hmm. you were a professor. From there, you come to this role where mm -hmm. there's a little bit of like elbowing and like climbing the ladder. How did you take it personally? Like even that point of like mm -hmm. you working on someone else's script yeah. instead of having your own voice. Like talk yeah. to me about that navigation. Oh, I, I struggled for a bit, you know, and I, I struggled with a few things. One was when you come from, you know, academia and a yeah. lot of other fields, but in academia, if we work at the university together and you say to me, Michael, I'm organizing this conference. Um, I really want you to speak at it. And I say, great, email me. You're probably going to email me. Yeah. And it's probably going to happen. Yeah. In Los Angeles, New York, other media centers, if someone says, oh, my God, Michael, so good to catch up with you. I love the work you're doing. I think we could do something interesting. Here's my email. Like, let's, let's get something going. Or, oh, my God, I have this idea. I think you'd be perfect to write for it, perfect to start it, whatever. Yeah. 99, not even 99, 999 times out of 1,000 or whatever. That's never going to happen. happen though. And I didn't know that at first. So when I first moved out here, I would have these like conversations and coffees and stuff. And I would just every day be like, this is so great. <laughs> I met these great guys and they just, they love me and yeah. we're going to we're gonna change the world together. <clears throat> and then you maybe hear back once or see that person later and they act like they don't know you. So... Um, I struggled with that and I even struggled early on. There was a period where I was freelance working at Wisecrack. Yeah. I was doing a lot of meetings there, was helping to develop some stuff. And then like some stuff didn't happen the way I thought it would or wanted it to. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point I, I was like, cool, I'm going to take a break from working with you guys. Cause I don't like how this feels. So, you know, it was, I, I had to learn what the new game was. Yeah. And I had to learn how my values would fit with that. I, what were those values? Um, <clears throat> besides hydration, <laughs> I, I think my values are, um, I, I never want to be full of shit. Okay. Um, I never want to treat someone like they are uh, in ends to some goal I want. I want to treat everyone like a valuable human being. And I want to work with people who share a sense of those values. I want to work with people that aren't assholes. I want to work with people that have a creative vision. And I want to work with people who value the people they work with. Um, yeah. Well, I will get back to that. But like more, like, let's say someone who's stepping into the industry, they have those same values. Mm -hmm. But they don't have the privilege to be yeah. like non-negotiable in mm -hmm. that aspect. So what would you say to those people? I mean, first of all, I'd say none of us have that. And we can maybe talk yeah. about this later. But, you know, I... A thing I have to deal with is like, yeah. we have to have sponsors yeah. in some of our content to make the money to keep the channel going. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. It's economics. Yeah. Um, Good old capitalism. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And under that system, I don't always get to say, you know, great. Every single brand partner yeah. I love. Yeah. I love their values. I love what they stand for. That's not realistic. Yeah. And if one was going to hold that line hard and fast, you're, you're not going to, it's, it's going to be hard. So in terms of like giving advice to someone who has that same thing, it's like what you have agency over is the people at your level you choose to work with. That's awesome. Yeah. You have agency over who you write with, who you make your short films with, yeah. who you start doing stuff with. And then those people inevitably, some are going to make more stuff. Some are going to move into other areas. Some are going to move back home and be much happier than the people that stay here. But that's what you do have some agency over. And I guess that's, I feel like where you where you should focus, like people at your level, people one rung above you on the ladder, one rung below you, find your people in that world. Mm -hmm. And I also think it's so corny and golden ruley, but it's also like, you know, always remember when you were starting out or when you PA'd on something or when you were the, when you were the lowest person there, like how did people treat you? How did that feel? Correct. Yeah. Um, 
And I just think that like, if, if everyone did that, if everyone thought as they like climb that ladder, yeah, how did I feel when I was the lower person on the totem pole? Um, I think things would go a lot better. That's awesome. Uh, since you brought up uh, sponsors, mm-hmm. so back when you joined a Wise Crack, what was the monetization avenues mm-hmm. and how those things changed today? Yeah, I mean, some of this. So I did a thing for a lot of years where I wanted to know not almost nothing about yeah. the back end of things. Yeah, and by that consciously. Yeah, yeah. I I was like, I'll write stuff. Yeah, I'll come in for the podcast. I'll host stuff or whatever. But I was like, I don't. I don't do businessy things. Yeah. I don't care about any of this. Yeah. I just kind of wanted to stay ignorant to it. Yeah. So take everything I say about some of this with that grain of salt. <laughs> but very early on, it was pretty standard. Like either, you know, AdSense money, the money you get from from just the ads that are built into YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, there gradually were more and more sponsors on both the videos and our podcast, um, brand partnership things. Um, and then for us, we've, you know, at various points, it's been big, it's been small, but Patreon yeah, has always been a, a pretty big thing for yeah. the channel as well. So those have kind of always been the consistent things. Yeah, the thing that pops in and out every now and then will That's be a, like a full integration. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. So and for anyone watching doesn't know exactly what I'm talking about there, but you know that'll be like uh, Universal Pictures. It's like we have this movie coming out. Pitch us to make a video that's about that movie. That will be a wisecrack video, yeah. but we'll tell people, hey, go see this, this movie. movie. Yeah, and those you get more money for Bigger check yeah than doing a 30 second shout out for a brand partner so that's that's like the less consistent part of things yeah but sometimes getting landing one of those mm-hmm. can be more significant financially than you know uh eight videos sponsored by a, a standard partner so like a sponsorship or something like that um like at the end of the day, what Wisecrack and a lot of YouTube channels or a lot of creatives are doing is like making like, you know, creative work mm-hmm. where they're like being vulnerable and like coming up with ideas and like mm-hmm. presenting it to all. Because at the end of the day, if you break it down first principles, that is what it is. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you in an organization insulate the rest of the team, mm-hmm. all the people who are grinding it out in the minds, making all this content from all these pressures and all these variables that you cannot control, i.e. Yeah. the monetization and all that? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, I've gotten to see the shift, right? Because I spent a lot of years as someone who was insulated. Yeah. And um, a really, really wonderful person I worked with at Wisecrack named Alec Opperman, who was, I know, I always forget job titles because, like, <laughs> who cares? But he was head of something, head yeah. of creative or head of content or something. And I think something he did to an extent was almost, like, take one for the team. Okay. In terms of being the one who would be in the calls and have to know all the nitty gritty business stuff. And to the rest of us, or many of us would be like, just keep writing, keep yeah. keep speaking on camera, keep working on your podcast. I'll kind of take care of this. And I do think there is a value in that, a value in having some sort of structure yeah. where someone who's up for it, because no one should ever be forced into that job, is willing to kind of have more of a foot in that world. Yeah. And I think that creatively... Maybe this is a weird take I have, but I think if people don't need to be involved in that, I don't think they should. Yeah. Because I think people should get to focus on what they want to do or what their, like, skill set is. Yeah. So I guess there's – I mean, I guess it's a larger organizational question. In some some cases, you might not have that choice. Correct. Yeah, I was about to say that. So, like, what you said right now kind of, like, fits into, like, organizations and, like, mm-hmm. teams and stuff like that. But there are a lot of creators who are independent Mm -hmm. and have like really small skeleton teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's your suggestion to those kind of people and how do you keep your creative brain churning while at the same time you have to keep your lights on? Oh, God, that's so hard. I mean, uh, this is hubristic to say because I haven't really been in that exact situation. Okay. Um, As I've been lucky enough to come into things that have already existed. But... I don't know. I, I feel like having this is maybe a weird response, but I feel like having a relationship with your audience can cover a multitude of sins. Okay. And what I mean by that is if there is That's a fascinating. Okay. if there is a meaning to what you do. I, I mean, I'll give you a very okay. immediate example. Yeah. Um, we do a, a once a week live stream. It's a relatively yeah. recent thing for us. And you know, we did one today. I watched one today, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um and there is a and growing group of people yeah. who are there every week, yeah. whose usernames I know in the chat, yeah. many of whom then join our Patreon, get yeah. on our Discord. These are people now who I 
not only feel like I know yeah. who I like, yeah. um, who I think are like interesting, smart, funny, challenging people in, in a good way. Yeah. And, you know, occasionally, yeah. and this literally happened today, yeah. I got a little spicy about an internet figure that some people like. Okay. And some of those trolls, you know, find places to comment and say stuff. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for the relationships with that awesome audience that we have, the core, it yeah. would be so much harder to deal with the bullshit yeah. of like trolls. And I think in the same way, it, it would be a lot harder to deal with, you know, a brand deal that falls through a partner that at the last minute tells you they don't approve the video. You have to change something before you run the ad, but you need to put the video out that day, yada, yada. I think all of that is easier if you are not, if you're not making your content for the numbers on your YouTube analytics screen, mm -hmm. if you are making content for human beings on the other end of it. And while I might only get to interact with some of those people on live stream and some of those people who are like nice enough to say hi at a bar or something. Yeah. Though that's who I'm thinking about. See, like, I don't know what the term is, but that's like the opposite of a parasocial relationship because mm -hmm. you are consciously, and I guess your producers as well, are consciously thinking of like, not just like the, like the singular commentators, but also like the community writ large. Yeah. And caring and catering the content towards them. Because like sometimes when you're making like scripted content, which you are great at and the channel is great at, sometimes that one-on-one -on -one time mm -hmm. is like, not there but mm -hmm. when you do streams mm -hmm. and that's why i think like twitch is so clutch for yeah. community building because you it feels like you are like spending one-on-one -on -one time right i mean yeah and you look at the way on twitch as well when you know like example of, of course one of the biggest people on twitch but with like hassan right Hassan yeah. piker a horrible tragedy happens in turkey recently and because hassan is, is engaged and has that audience he is able to raise literally so millions money, yeah. of dollars to do something positive to affect that thing. And I think that a lot of people who might make content on other platforms could not do that. Even people who have- That audience. As many views, you know, as many people- Doesn't do. have that relationship. Yeah. And, and you know, like also people like Hassan put in the work of doing that every a long freaking day. day. Yeah. But I just think there's, there's just a value in having those relationships. On the flip side, going too yeah. far in that end yeah. could also burn you out emotionally because you're you feel like you more invested. you have to make content. But since you're talking about platforms, let's just go back to like like YouTube and all platforms in general. Uh, does it ever feel I don't know what the right objective is for like feel like weird or like pessimistic about the fact that at the end of the day, all these channels, all these content is getting built on platforms that you don't have any control over like you are building uh, your house on a rented land yeah like how does that feel like the vulnerability of it it's really scary yeah um you know it's like I, I like the house on land you don't own it's you know it's writing your orchestra on the titanic yeah. <laughs> you know it, it's scary and you even think you know if, if someone if mr youtube at youtube headquarters yeah. hit the off switch one day yeah it's like well what do we do, we do yeah and yeah, I don't, there's no like happy way to put that. I do think that some platforms are better than others. Yeah. I think that some platforms have a history of longevity. Yeah. And I think that's really important. Um, I think right now a thing that we're seeing is maybe some people see this shinier new object, maybe something like TikTok, yeah. hypothetically, and that might turn some people away from valuing something like YouTube. But, but all I know is YouTube has been around, and I'm not like shilling for YouTube now. No, no, but, <laughs> um, but you know, YouTube has been around as a lot of other smaller platforms have come and gone. Come and gone, yeah. And, and I think that there's, you know, attention, be attention between engaging with the new things and yeah. using them in, in creative ways. Yeah. But also remembering that some platforms might have a consistency. Correct. And I do think the thing that's most important, in my humble opinion, is having something that's not that that you make money and build community on mm -hmm. um i think this is where things like patreon come yeah in. and i think that you know because we can't control if there's a bad financial quarter and a lot of brands we normally work with say we're taking a break which happens yeah. um it was happening in in the last quarter of last year we're kind of coming out of it in q1 of this year kind of yeah and if you don't have 
a place where you're diversifying some of that, yeah, then how do you weather that storm? I don't know. I think that diversifying is super important, not from like a monetary point of view, but it's like, you know, like Wisecrack has developed this audience and a lot of YouTube channels have developed this audience. Like, let's say like even like Twitch, mm -hmm. Twitch goes down tomorrow. I don't know. I'm like 99% sure like Hassan's audience will travel with Hassan wherever he decides to stream next. Yeah. And that is because of the relationship he has with the community. He, he could talk in a local park with <laughs> a megaphone and he would fill the park. I mean, yeah. he's, he's good no matter what. Yeah. yeah. But so like that relationship is like super important. Uh, changing gears a little bit, um, what you said about like playing into the game a little bit. Like at the end of the day, uh, Wisecrack is making like really deep philosophical mm -hmm. content which makes you think but at the end of the day you're still beholden to the title thumbnail mm -hmm. jargon if you may yeah. right not, not if you may that's it i mean at yeah, the end yeah. of the day i'm sure people know this like the weight that a title and thumbnail have on all of this is immense yeah and like so how do you like a balance that mm -hmm. and b i don't know if contest that is the right way like how do you get over that mental switch I don't know if you get over it. I think you accept the reality of it. Yeah. I know that I, for a lot of years, didn't accept the reality of it. Yeah. Like just my my especially coming from academia, right? Yeah. Coming from academia and coming from someone that consumed a lot of non YouTube content, content. Yeah. I didn't believe how much it mattered. Yeah. Then when I realized how much it mattered, I didn't want the responsibility for it. <laughs> uh, and it took a while for me to be like, no, like I need to be involved in this. And we are. There, we have like a core four team now and, yeah. and shout outs to my coworkers, uh, Amanda Lux and Olivia, they're great people. And, you know, we've just gotten a lot more serious about those conversations and, you know, a really like in the weeds thing for us is even thinking about the difference between, do you come up with a good idea, write and shoot the good idea and then say, what's the title and thumbnail or the other way, or do you have the idea? Yeah. And before you, you write one word yeah. or put, get one visual loaded, yeah. say, well, what's the title and thumbnail going to be? Yeah. We historically were the first, we're yeah. literally the last thing we did. It's title and thumbnail. Yeah. We're now starting to shift that. Yeah. And I'm glad that we are. Cause the former is the more creative approach mm -hmm. and the latter is the more engineered mathematical approach. Yeah. And I don't know, like to each their own, I guess. But yeah. like, it's it's something which you have to contest. It's like again, like if you're you're building your house on a rented land, mm -hmm. you have to follow the landowners, yeah, you know, rules. And it's a thing I've learned in that the more we have accepted that we are playing a certain game, and this yeah. game has rules, and we will have thumbnails sometimes that are closer to like you know clickbait. the dreaded word yeah. clickbait, right? Yeah, and. The, uh, the funniest thing is the videos where the most people in the comments will be like, oh, this is clickbait, are the ones that do the best. Yeah. Are the ones that where it's like, yeah. you know, you get like a, yeah. a half a million views and people are mad. And it's like, well, I get that you guys are mad, <laughs> but this also got us half a million views, yeah. which is helping us keep the lights on for yeah. a few days. And sometimes the subtle artsy thumbnails yeah. with a title that's just straightforward. Yeah. No, no, no. Oh, so I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's again, I think it's that it's thing of if I'm running a restaurant, right? Yeah. Um, oh I, I could be the person who makes the best food ever yeah. um, and doesn't advertise. Yeah. I can make real shitty food yeah. and have really good commercials. Or yeah. I could be the guy who's out front of the door is like, hey, come in, try this, da 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 yeah. But if my shit is good, yeah. then you're not going to be mad at me. No, yeah. When you sit down and you're skeptical and I start bringing you food and it's yeah. delicious, you're like, you don't care that the advertising was loud or whatever. Yeah. And I feel like that's the wager. Someone clicks and maybe they feel like this is clickbaity, but if within 30 seconds they're like, oh, they might have advertised this in a really like lowest common denominator yeah. way, but now they're opening up a really interesting discussion. Yeah. Our our wager is that they'll be like, okay, well, let's find whatever. Yeah. yeah. I think like, I don't know who said it. I think Casey Nice said it. It's mm -hmm. like the thing is like intrigue, don't deceive. Like, mm -hmm. As long as I'm not being lied to, I don't really care how much yeah. of like, sh sh like pizzazz there is. For sure. Yeah. I, I think lying is bad. I yeah. think draw, drumming up controversy that could potentially hurt people or, or breed negativity is bad. Yeah. But I think, you know, and it's that horrible language that gets used of, of which we all have to use, of like pain points and stuff like that. Yeah. It, it feels gross to say, but it's like, what is, again, like we all do this. We're on all these platforms and all of these things are scrolling by us constantly and you're competing with more things than ever before, what what can you do with an image and a few words 
don't make someone stop. I know, right? It's so hard. I want to get back to all this like, yeah, yeah. note stuff, but like since we're talking about crazy thumbnails, I have to talk about, you know, Mr. Beast uh -huh. and what uh, uh, you were talking about in the recent days. And a lot of people, funny enough, in the news circle I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And the discourse has been like super interesting to me. And I'm for, like, my personal relationship mm -hmm. with Mr. Beast content is like, I'm an observer. Like, I like mm -hmm. to see, like, what is he doing and how is he making it work? I see him as, like, a really crazy businessman mm -hmm. more than I see him as a creative. And that's not pejorative. Like, maybe he's no, both. I, yeah. Uh, but obviously, the video we're talking about is the video where he, quote-unquote, cured blindness uh -huh. for a thousand people, mm -hmm. I think. And the discourse around it, obviously, I want you to speak about it, is... Um, like, is this something we should be okay with as a mm -hmm. society? And a lot of the flack that was thrown into this, mm -hmm. like, people thought that people are talking about Mr. Beast is a bad person for mm -hmm. doing this. And obviously, you had the crazy people on the internet mm -hmm. who are like, he's the Satan or whatever. But, like, just please enlighten me on, like, what your take was on this whole thing. And yeah. how do you, like, reckon with the fact that we live in a society where uh, people getting their eyesight is something which we watch for fun. Mm -hmm. I don't know yeah. how to put it. And I really love the way you put that, that he's a business genius, maybe yeah. more so than a creative genius. Yeah. Like you said, it's not a pejorative, it's not a negative thing to say. Yeah. Um, business geniuses tend to retire a lot more comfortably than yeah. just creative geniuses. Yeah. So I think the other thing with this too, I just, I, I couldn't help but think last week, like, I don't know, like you can, people can say that they don't like Harry Styles, let's say. Yeah. And no one cares. Yeah. Because like Harry Styles sells, sells out stores, arenas. Yeah. Okay. So you might like indie music or whatever. Yeah. And you're like, that's not for me. Harry Styles doesn't care. Yeah. No one around him cares. Yeah. And we gotta remember that like Mr. Beast is not the underground, you know, underdog hero of YouTube. He is the Harry Styles. He's the biggest person on the platform. He is a mega Period, star. Yeah. He makes more money than anyone else. He has a bigger team than anyone else. He does things on a scale that no one else can do. And that's amazing. But also, you know, you're gonna catch some flack sometimes if you're the big, you know, big man on campus. Yeah, yeah. Punch I think, him up. Yeah. yeah, with that video in particular, yeah. I think that there's at least two things going on, right? One yeah. thing is some people watched that video and felt a little weird, yeah. felt a little icky, a little queasy. Yeah. And as they were thinking to themselves, well, I don't think Jimmy, Mr. Beast, is a bad person. Yeah. I don't think their team are bad people. They're doing something good. So why do I feel weird? Yeah. You know, is there something wrong with me? Yeah. I think that a lot of people arrived at this idea, and this was kind of the line we took at Wisecrack, and we, we had a stream about it and put out a video on it, ended up at a line that was sort of like, the thing that feels bad about this is that it's necessary. Mm. What feels, you know, it's not that Jimmy and his team are bad people. It's not that the people getting this surgery are bad people. It's not that the doctor doing it is a bad guy. It's that, it's weird to live in a world where if you have an easily curable condition and you live in the wealthiest country in the history of human civilization that you have to rely, uh, you know, on, on a guy in his early 20s and his <laughs> friends to pick you to fix it for a YouTube video. That feels weird. Saying that out loud, I, I imagine going back in a time machine 10 years, 15 years, and if you told someone that, they'd be like, I don't want to live in that timeline yeah um and i think that you can feel that while also understanding that that doesn't mean one assumes malicious intent yeah for that team and, and like you said too i don't think they're a team of you know creatively minded um progressive ethicist yeah i think they're a team that's run by a lot of dudes in their early 20s that want to do cool shit yeah and i think they have some impulse to use some of the money they've made doing cool shit to do some good stuff yeah but also the guy has said in interviews like sorry this, I, got, I was getting so annoyed last week no no go on yeah please yeah the guy himself has said in interviews when i do good things like i make more money yeah he's not an idiot it's yeah. true we get drawn to those things yeah so to have the creator themselves say that which is totally fair yeah fine yeah. that's the game. game yeah he's playing the game he's so good at playing the game but also let's just be honest that that he, he's still playing the game when he makes that video. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's sorry to interrupt, but like he understands the social engineering mm -hmm. aspect of it, and he's taking the taking advantage of it. Which again, 
I want to like make it really clear is not something I'm like saying that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm no. pretty sure neither are you. But at the same time, we as a society find that spectacle like, you know, amusing and to your point, necessary yeah. is where we feel icky. Yeah, and I think it's that important thing too where like the YouTube and the digital content world is a world. It is not the, the world. The world, yeah. So we have to have the ability to step outside of that yeah. and, and have a critical lens. Yeah. And we have to have the ability to understand that like not every creator is a god and they're not all evil. They're, they're people navigating things. And I think there's like a spectrum of, you know, uh, some people trying to be more creative and good, other people just trying to do the business side of things. But, you know, I think the most disappointing part about the discourse around that was the inability of people to see that you could, you know, react to that video in a way that made you feel bad, but the bad feeling is about the world and not that person. And, you know, people will be like, what is, what is he supposed to do? Or what have you done? It's like, yeah. that's not the point. point yeah. Not the point at all. The point is that we live in a world where this has to happen and that feels bad. Yeah. And I think it's the same reason. And a lot of people, you know, in comments and some messages to us did reach out to be like, hey, thanks for articulating this. Because some of the older videos where they just like gave money to homeless people made me feel weird. Yeah. This helps articulate why that made me feel, feel weird. weird. Yeah. And I think that it's okay to be like, it is objectively good that a person that probably needed money got some money. money. Objectively awesome. good. Yeah. And it's also objectively okay yeah. for that to make you feel weird. Queasy. Yes, yeah. because it, it's like we're playing this game show logic. Yeah. To, to who gets to it's survive. Like the squid in our game world. feeling. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah, I don't want to harp on this too long because I it's fine. like I would just keep going on this forever, especially like from someone who comes from politics and that side of the world. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope I can get time to get back to this but like since we are on the topic of creators i really want to touch on and this is a tangent obviously um the trend of like really talented tr creators getting big and then leaving their parent organization mm -hmm. and the first name which comes to my mind um is um johnny harris mm -hmm. like great content followed yeah. him forever when i was in i guess like grad school like maps mm -hmm. and then he left fox yeah to do his own thing which he has been really successful and yeah. really clutch at so tell me like like what are the pros and cons a creator should think about while before leaving or why that yeah. needs to happen in the first place yeah i love that you bring up johnny harris yeah i love that guy um no it's awesome yeah we have we have a, tr a whole thing we do on our stream called the harris hole where we try to watch I, all of his videos i did hear that a couple of times but i didn't know what you guys thought it's about. one of our like inside, <laughs> inside jokes just, i mean yeah. to, to kind of go back to that whole thing of like yeah the importance of having a community having inside jokes with your audience is the best mm -hmm. and uh, God, I love the maps, but the dude runs such a cool operation. Yeah. And even if I don't, and sometimes I don't like his videos and some of his other stuff is a little weird, <laughs> but, but he just, uh, A, I mean, who looks better in a beanie than Johnny Harris? I know, right? I mean, it's unfacetiously. Like, yeah, I'm no. like, if, if I could look like a dude, yeah. let me, God, make me Johnny <laughs> Harris. Um, but I mean, he's just, also, hold up, before we go into yeah. this side note, I really adore like the fact that him and is are kind of this like the same creative YouTube people and they just live together to the studio in their house. That's just so awesome. It's amazing. <laughs> I mean, and I love that recently, in a lot of the recent videos on Johnny's channel, yeah, Johnny, like I know him, yeah. on, on Mr. Harris's channel, um, it's a lot more like behind the scenes. Like he had the video where he showed, the one that was like Miso Soup Monday. Yeah. I'm obsessed with that. The idea <laughs> they make a giant pot of Miso Soup every Monday in their house studio. But that wasn't your question. Yeah, no. Um, the going independent yeah. part, yeah. I think it's an amazing thing that someone like Johnny Harris has done. Yeah. I think that it is not a feasible thing for most people. Mm. Um, and I don't say that to be like a bummer about yeah, it, no. but you know, I have thought before. Yeah. What would happen if my parent company shut down? What would happen if I said something too spicy on a stream and, and they had to fire me or something like that? Hopefully that doesn't happen. And I thought, like, what would it mean to like go independent? And it's just I feel like every day that goes on, I do feel like that is harder because it's kind of like Jerry Maguire, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. When he he leaves and he's like, who's coming with me? He's my first client. Yeah. yeah. And no one goes with him yeah. but, except for Renee Zellweger. Renee. Because, you know, because they have something going on. They yeah. have a steady routine. We don't like to do new things. So to leave, you just have to have, I don't know, you have to have a team that's going to go with you and support you. And also you just have to have money. Yeah, because it costs money. Because let's let's say I 
And if anyone from my parent company watches this, this is just, <laughs> I'm just, it's just an example. I really mean that. Let's say I decide I want to leave and start my own thing. Yeah. Well, step one is like, well, I don't have a bunch of money saved up. Yeah. So how am I going to pay rent for the next month? Now I got to hire people to do stuff because there's a lot of things I can't do on my own. I'm definitely going to have a dip in quality in the content I'm making. How am I going to let people know about the channel? Um, how am I going to find a niche that's not just what I already have? I mean, there's just so many steps. Variables, yeah. And if I had like $20,000 in savings, sure, could like bet on myself and fund it and figure it out. But I feel like it would be hard. And I feel like the infrastructure that comes from working for a bigger organization makes life easier sometimes. Definitely. At least but if that's someone's dream, they should totally do it. Doing, yeah. I, I mean, just think it's it's hard. It's definitely like not just hard. You have to sometimes start using the other side of the brain because mm -hmm. creatives for better or worse are only used to use their right side of the brain. Mm -hmm. But once you grow, like go independent, it's like you're basically a business owner now. Yeah. Like got to use that. Like, well, and you know who's good at brain. this stuff? Um, a side of YouTube I like a lot that has nothing to do with my work is guitar YouTube. I watch really? a, lot of my, a lot of the channels I watch the most are people that make like guitarist yeah. guitar videos, whether it's teaching something or going over gear or whatever. And a lot of these people are geniuses. There's this one guy, I might get his last name wrong. It's like Michael Palomano or Palomino or something uh -huh. like that. He has a channel called Guitar Gate. He has a channel, he does a series of videos called Guitar Teacher Reacts. None of his videos are monetized because in all of his videos, he plays copyrighted, you know, clips. content. Yeah. Um, but he's pivoted it into developing a series of guitar courses that he has like thousands and thousands of, of users. Subscribers, yeah. Yeah, and he makes just an ass ton of money. A lot of money, yeah. And I say that with all respect, respect for him. Yeah. But I think that you look at a lot of the guitar YouTubers, their numbers are not that impressive, grand, grand scheme of things. Yeah. However, they have figured out how to package what they do in a way where they make a bunch of content and they also make enough money to keep the lights on. And I think that that sort of like educational space they're attached to helps. I think for a lot of people though, like what does that look like? Yeah. Like if you're someone that makes things that are more in the journalistic space or the ideas space, what does it really look like yeah. to do something like that? Like, like what What are you selling exactly mm -hmm. becomes the question you yeah. start thinking about. And that guy, again, Michael Palomanzano, I think maybe. I'll look at him, I'll put him on the screen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just going to say Italian name. I'm to not a guitarist. Over and over. <laughs> But he, I saw he put out a course recently, yeah, and it's a course on how to make courses or something like that. It's like it's like a video course, a niche of niche of niche. Yeah, yeah. and I, I only saw his video where he pitched it, but he's basically yeah. like, I did this for guitar, you could do it for your thing. Yeah, and I think more and more so, if someone did want to do their own thing, you'd have to think about stuff like that. Yeah, you can't just rely on AdSense, Sense, yeah, and and you know partnerships. God, there are so many things I want to talk to you about, but like let's do yeah. like two big meta questions. Cool. Like, since we're on the top. <laughs> Since we're on the topic of, um, you know, money and how to monetize and all that stuff, I really want you to give pragmatic, pessimistic advice about people wanting to step into the space. Because uh -huh. from like the outside and it looks like, you know, fancy YouTube, you know, AdSense, money, brand deals and all that stuff. I want you to give all the cautionary tales that you can give that you have experienced yourself uh, starting your life again mm -hmm. in LA doing this thing. Like when creatives step into any of these space, there's like obviously a romantic aspect. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, I'm here for the arts. Mm -hmm. I'm here to get it done. But at the same time, they're eating ramen every night. Yeah. So tell me that story. Well, I mean, I'll tell you this. When I first moved to Los Angeles, I had this sense that I, I couldn't get a full-time job. Yeah. Because I was going to be a person, a creative person. So I needed to have time to like write freelance stuff, to stay out late performing at comedy shows, to, to go to auditions, to do all the stuff. And if I had a full-time job, how could I do that? Yeah. And my first year living here, I made not a lot of money. Okay. And I was very lucky to have a partner who was like, I'll pay all the rent for six months. She's the best. If you're watching this, I love you. <laughs> um, but I slowly realized that what I ended up doing was making no money. So I was constantly anxious about money. And having so many things going on, I never had the time to focus on any one thing. Okay. Eventually, I had the opportunity to get a full-time job um, as a writer for a company that made videos that wasn't something I loved. I won't say the name. It oh, wasn't. Um, no, you didn't try to pull me into it. I was no. saying it to myself because my <laughs> tendency is just to like, yeah, let's let's name names. But I don't want to do that. name drop, yeah. And I think I signed an NDA, <laughs> so I don't know. Um, but... You know, and I was really hesitant because I was like, what if I, I don't want them to have my creative energy? That's yeah. mine. But then what happened was I 
took that job. Yeah. Got health care. Yeah. Had some solid, you know, benefits. Had that good old runway, yeah. Yeah, had yeah. a nice little salary. And because I didn't really care about the work I was doing there, I'm not putting my heart into Freed it. you up. Then I had yeah. so much more time and energy to work on my own things. Mm. So I do think whether you're making content, writing songs, painting, anything, I mean, this is an old man thing of me to say. I just, you never underestimate the value of a full-time job that gives you some sort of consistency. And it also makes me think of a tweet by one of my favorite writers who's a music writer. I'm um, Craig Jenkins, works for New York Magazine. Uh -huh. um, and he tweeted years ago something that was like, do it, do it part-time yeah. until it's your full-time or something yeah. like that. And that was an important mindset for me at one point as well. Like use the pockets of time you have to do a thing and I think slowly build it out yeah. until it is a thing you can do full-time. But I think pragmatism is better than romanticism of course, yeah. in this way. Yeah. And I think that even if it's like you have the full-time job, but you carve out these hours of your yeah. day, or maybe you're able to reduce hours and start doing one thing more and more. But I would just say like in the world we live in, if you, if you can get a salary and you get your health care, fucking it's take clutch, that. Yeah. And then try to use your time to build something on top of the, it. The, the, the reason that's so important for people to hear, because like in the last decade, there was like such a romanticization of like, leave your full-time job mm -hmm. to whatever, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's like concerning because there is a growing cadre of the rising internet's middle class, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are making some money doing something for some content creator somehow while not thinking about what their next step is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, if they had a full-time job while they're also doing that, I think that's a better thing. Yeah. And I just think too, and you've brought this up a few times, like diversifying is helpful, thinking about making money as a creative in a variety of ways. I listened to an interview the other day. Back to me saying people's names wrong, but <laughs> Jack Conti, the guy that started Oh, Patreon. Patreon, Jack Conti. Yeah, yeah he was love that guy. a really fun musician. Love that um, guy. I, I, his, like, uh, the videos they put on their their Facebook, uh, not Facebook, um, Instagram and, and YouTube are so fun. But I don't know, listening to him talk about Patreon and creatives finding ways to build audiences and monetize stuff. I th and I think a lot of the stuff he'll talk about that's specific to musicians can apply to non-musicians. Mm. And, and I think that it's maybe more of like a slow and steady route, Born, yeah. but a potentially more consistent route uh, and something people should think of. One of the most fascinating thing I heard in this genre is like Kevin Kelly mm -hmm. uh, said this thing about like a thousand true fans. Like yeah. if you have a thousand true fans, you can make, you can sell them something worth a hundred dollars. And if they're willing to buy that, then you can make six figures and yeah. that's all life. But until you have that, you need to think about yeah. dinner. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I hate like business bro platitudes Ugh. so much, but the thousand true fan thing, there's something to it. Yeah. There's there, definitely there something, really to, something it. to it. And the difference between making a video that might get a hundred thousand, 200,000, 300,000 views by people who are just like clicking through mm -hmm. and having a core audience who really care about what you do. Yeah. And then I think that's the thing, right? When you start making stuff, what do we all want to do? Yeah. Biggest possible thing. Correct. We want to see like, what's, what's the thing that's doing the best? What's the thing? How can I imitate that? But it's like, what would it be to focus on a small group of people? What, what would it be to think about Niche, like, what do yeah. you really want to see and build out slowly? Again, all of this is easier said than done, but... I know. Okay, uh. so last question, and this has nothing to do with my channel or what I'm trying to do here, and I'm only asking you because I have your brain here, is uh, 2024 is leading up, mm -hmm. and I just want you to talk about a... Not just... I know it's super vague, but whatever. Uh, the political landscape, uh -huh. and all, not just the political landscape, but the political media landscape mm -hmm. on both sides. Yeah, um... I think the po the political landscape on both sides paint the darkest picture possible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have various companies run by people who have no political values, hosted by a lot of individuals who have no interest in any of these debates because they're all doing fine and they're all a member of the same like supper clubs in DC and New York and they're all friends together when they're not like yelling at each other on TV. Yeah. And they think that we're all sloppy little pigs <laughs> who need our content slop. And they're going to try to make us the spiciest content slop. And they're going to hope that we don't ask what's in the slop or who made the slop. And it gets worse and worse every cycle. And very smart people every cycle fall into it. I will fall into it in some ways. We all will. Um, 
And then, of course, on the other side, it's like, but I have my, my internet sources, mm. and they're better because they're not the mainstream media. But we have a bunch of people on that side that are well. doing yeah. the same thing in a different way. And I don't think any of that's going to get easier. And I think the level of individual discernment and ability to be critical about things is becoming more necessary than ever. To even touch back to the Mr. Beast thing, right? Yeah. If we don't have the ability to say, but why yeah. do people need this? We're going to be screwed. But you, you said to paint a dark picture. Now I feel no, bad. Go for dark it. Picture, no. but I'm, I come from the news world. I love dark pictures. Yeah, I mean, you know, and maybe something cool happens. Yeah. Like maybe something cool happens or maybe a kind of recent obsession of mine is what someone like Ron DeSantis is trying to do to the education system using the state of Florida oh. as a test case. Like, I don't know that that's just going to keep happening and it's going to happen on a larger scale. So yeah. I 2024 is going to be crazy. And I think, you know, do you have any, do you have any wrong predictions for us? Here, oh, here's my best wrong prediction. Yeah. My biggest wrong prediction is at the last minute. Yeah. Um, Joseph Biden decides he's not up for it. Yeah. And J.B. Pritzker, governor <laughs> of Illinois, hero to all, steps in on his family's jet because he, he's the good billionaire. J.B. Pritzker is like the good billionaire. He's, the, he's from his billionaire family, but he's the good one. He, he's the working man's billionaire. <laughs> and he comes in and he saves the day. He's and, the anti Dr. Oz. And yeah. he turns America into a paradise of Midwestern liberal values or something. Um, that's my prediction. It will never happen, but I, I have a soft love for J.P. Pritzker. Because um, you're from the Midwest? From the Chicago land okay, originally. Yeah. And I just love his whole like billionaire yeah. who has an everyman vibe. Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> um, and I think, I think he wants to be president, so. Perfect, that's such a, you know, uh, civil lining rod. Again, thank you for your time. <laughs> You're so good at this, by the way. I'm not. Um, my, you're my sixth interview. So. Well, no, if you're if you're this good, six interviews in. <laughs> God, the guy. I'm jealous of the guy who's your twelfth interview. That's gonna be a great time. <laughs>